my name is Harlan Dibron, and I have my daughter and son-in-law teach at the high school, Sarah Dibron Mitch and Tom Mitch, and I have two grandchildren that go to the elementary school, Annika and Luca. And I taught at Eastern Mennonite University for many years, so that's kind of a carryover that we, I had a lot of students from EMS that were my students there. Okay. Okay. I'm Claire Gibran, and I think Harlan's introduced the family, so um, that, that's taken care of, I think. Okay. Okay. Um, so we think about our chapel theme this year, and it's telling our stories. Mm -hmm. And we thought it would be um, a great time to learn from grandparents, um, for them to think back to when you were the age of our students. Um, mm -hmm. Whether you had an important influence, a person of great influence, um, who maybe was a generation older than your parents, um, be it a grandparent or someone else that you remember who mm -hmm. taught you something well or um, who, from whom you learned a lesson or um, how they shaped your life in some way or form. So can you share with us any stories of what you remember? Yeah, I have a little scenario. Um, we call them Mamere and Papere, which is French for grandmother and grandfather. And we only saw them twice a year for maybe four or five days at a time. But the times were memorable and taught me great lessons that I carry through my life. They always arrived by airplane, which in that time was quite unusual, and then fly in on an evening flight with this bright light coming through the dark Christmas holiday sky. And so with great anticipation, we would stand there and wait and wait and wait. And they were always the last ones off the plane. But we saw Mamer and Papere. So exciting. There are three things particularly that Papere, my grandfather, taught me. We had a short time together, but each time, he would always tell me fictional fairy tales, which he called the Winchester Tales. Mm -hmm. They were much like Narnia before their time, with magical animals that I never dreamed of. But the fairy tales that he would tell me were just opened up a new world to me of fantasy and excitement. Uh, secondly, in that short time, he would always take me to a restaurant for lunch, just the two of us. And we would just laugh and talk and listen and share life stories. And the third thing he did in that short time was he always read me stories from the life of Thomas Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, which was another world of life on the Mississippi River of young boys, which I found very exciting. But the impact those things had on my life were not the amount of time we spent because it was short nor the gifts that they gave me or presents because I don't remember anything, frankly. Uh, nor was it the answers or solutions they gave me to any immediate thing in life. But in Papere's presence, I felt loved, cared for, and valued. And that atmosphere allowed me to be my creative self. And it made me realize I wanted to find friends and pick friends in which I felt valued and loved and cared for. And even more importantly, I wanted to strive to offer that to others. And when people would leave my presence, whether it be a short or long time, that they would feel I'm loved, I'm valued, I'm cared for, so that they could be their creative selves as well. So I'd say thank you, Papere, for that great gift you gave me in a short time. That's a lovely story. And yes, the gift of time, which you can't measure, but which is so invaluable and so important. That's lovely. That's great. Thanks. Yeah. Claire, how about you? 
Okay. <clears throat> well, I actually chose my mother. She's one generation apart, but because she had such a profound influence on me, my mom was um, quietly strong, smart, and very compassionate. And she um, went to college. And after that, this would have been by, you know, 1939, 1940, those years, and became a teacher. Um, but she always loved to read. And our, our house was always um, full of books. And we also, I mean, it was just very literature rich. And we, we had a, a New York Times delivered daily, and she encouraged us to go to the library often. And um, it gave me a love of reading um, at an early age that, that just um, satisfied so many of my questions about the world and what life was like in places where I'd never been. She also always had a current set of encyclopedias because maybe it was the teacher in her, but she wanted to develop intellectual curiosity. And so when she would read the New York Times, she would then, and then when we were older, we could read it ourselves. But before that, she would tell us about world events, current events, and also historical events, World War II, the Holocaust, the civil rights movement, um, the, the, the space race, and, we would ask questions and then she would say, now you go look it up. Mm -hmm. And so we'd, we'd go and, and look things up and read more. Um, she kept us very aware of things. Um, I also think that she really loved the theater. And as a younger person, she had done some stage work, not local theater. And then she became somebody who was kind of behind the scenes. We lived about an hour from New York City. So on Saturdays, this was a great treat and wonderful experience. We would take the train into New York City and we would see a musical or another stage performance. And it just created um, an interest in places that were beyond where I lived and exposure to ideas and thoughts that were challenging, but beautiful and encouraging, and sometimes serious, obviously. Um, but that love of the theater was one way that I think she helped me develop into more than just a person living in a smaller world. She opened the world up for me. She also um, allowed me to travel when I was 15 to Europe with my best friend and her family. They were Swiss. And that also was an incredible experience for me. And she just filled my life with many valuable experiences that she really orchestrated and thought about and planned. Um, she also was someone who really believed in um, volunteer work and being involved in people's lives. And so as children, I can remember she was always looking for clothes to donate and to collect donations for children, the elderly, um, food, housing. She was she did a lot of work with kids and with el with the elderly population in our area. We had um, there was a program that used to be called the Fresh Air um, Fresh Air Kid Program. <laughs> And we had kids from New York City that would come out and spend a couple weeks with us in our home. And that was, that was a great experience for us. And we took in an, an American Field Service international student who lived in our home for my junior year in high school. And that was really fun and interesting. But she just encouraged these um, values and interests in, in being aware of what is going on globally and looking at issues like... Um, injustice and inequality. And I don't know when I was in high school if I completely understood the, the importance of that, but she definitely put a seed, planted a seed in me to look at those issues. And it really had an influence on my life. And so after college, I became a teacher. And then 10 years later, after Harlan and I had been married, we had our three kids. We went to serve with Africa Intermennonite Mission in Lesotho in Southern Africa. And none of this was a great surprise because I felt like my mother had been planting those seeds. When I was 14, she encouraged me to be a candy striper. And that was the term for youth students in high school and junior high who would get on a bus, go to a local city, or not local, but drive sometimes an hour, hour and a half to a city urban area and um, volunteer in hospitals, particularly veterans hospitals. And um, those, those things just had such a profound effect on me. And later in life, when I was introduced to Mennonites, 
that the Mennonite church became a, a wonderful home for me because it was it so enveloped all of those ideas and thoughts and beliefs and convictions and wanting to have a response to issues of, of inequality or injustice. And it really became a home for Harlan and me. And so that's the link to our faith and our choice of, you know, where we would okay. practice our faith. Yeah. Yeah. More great stories. Wow. She taught you a love of reading and yeah. And curiosity, a love of the theater, a love of service yeah. and community. Mm -hmm. So huge lessons that yeah. both of these family members had on you and carried out then through your adult years. It's fabulous. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for sharing these powerful stories and for spending a few minutes with us. And we hope to see you here on campus soon. So great. Thank you. Ik ben uh, Maarten Brouwer. Ik woon in Nederland. Ik spreek ook Nederlands. En ik ben de opa van Hans en Anneke McDonald. En ik ben Annie Brouwer. Uh, oma van Hans en Anneke. En ik woon in Nederland en ik spreek ook Nederlands. Think back when you were a teenager and who influenced you from an older generation. So denk terug naar jullie tienerjaren en wie als een oudere invloed op jullie hadden. Wel, toen wij jong waren, dat is al een hele poos geleden. <laughs> en toen was er niet één iemand die ons coachte of begeleidde, maar het waren meer de ouders en de schoolmeester en mensen van de kerk die je Eigenlijk begeleiden in de keuze die je maakt. Oké. Okay. En het was, het was eigenlijk niet eenmaal, maar met elkaar. Met elkaar, ja. Kan je aan... Ja, de grootouders leefden niet mee. Daar hadden we ook uh, daar geen contact mee. Yeah. Um, so, um, waarom is het belangrijk, of wat kan de grootouders... Wat voor... Influence kan grootouders hebben op hun kleinkinderen? Wel, dat is natuurlijk allereerst hun eigen leven. Hun eigen leven maken en doen. Maar verder, nou, Annie zei het al, onze, onze eigen grootouders hadden we toen niet meer, die leden niet meer. Ja. Maar ja, oudere mensen, daar was altijd wel iemand waar je tegenop keek. Zeiden, nou, En dat is een hele goede chauffeur of een hele goede, die zal het wel goed doen. Ja, en grootouders kunnen dus kinderen stimuleren, want echt helpen met het leren, dat is te groot verschil. Oké, okay. Annie, ander, uh, nog ander advies voor uh, Hans en Anneke? Ja, mijn advies heb ik al eerder gezegd, denk ik. Van, als je iets doet, doe het dan goed. Het is veel beter dat je je concentreert op één bepaald ding en daar te laten alles van weet, dan heel veel dingen waar je maar een klein beetje van weet. En goed, verder, ja, wie werkt maakt fouten. Maar dat is ook helemaal niet erg. Maar ben je wel bewust dat wanneer je een fout maakt, ook maar één keer de kans krijgt om die fout te herstellen. Dat wil ik hun graag wel meegeven dan. Oké. Okay. Nou, dan sluit ik me wel bij aan. Oké. Okay.